Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Omar Ben Parat. I'm from the Technion. This is a joint work with my advisor, Professor Moshe Tenenholz, called the Regression Equilibrium. Uh, it's related to this session and in particular to the, the talk you have just uh, witnessed by Guy. The, the motivation is basically the same. People have been talking about this prediction algorithm for so long now. There's a, an extensive literature on, on prediction algorithms, but Mainly, they are used in isolation. What do I mean by that? So um, revenue-seeking companies are using prediction, uh, prediction tools, prediction algorithms, and prediction services in their products in order to maximize their revenues or maybe increase user satisfaction, which is a proxy to, uh, to pay off. And mainly in, in the machine learning uh, literature, prediction is, is, uh, is thought of, of something that is being being uh, tackled in, in isolation. Namely, we have this data set, we solve a problem over the data set, we run an algorithm, then we get the result, and then maybe we publish a paper, maybe we uh, deploy it into our, company, our company's uh, pr um, production services, and so on. And namely, these, uh, the problem with this uh, state of mind is that we completely overlook market competition between, between those firms. Uh, so, let me give you a clear motivation so that we will have a story in mind. Think about this set of users. All of them are interested in uh, predicting the selling values of their apartment. Okay, So um, there is this company run by Alice. And Alice offers, uh, offers uh, free uh, prediction services on our website. So you can log on to Alice's website. You could upload photos of your apartments, maybe answer a few questions. For instance, how many rooms uh, it has and so on. And then, based on historical data, Alice would provide you with a prediction for the selling value of your apartment. Now, it's important, I'm going to assume in this talk, as we do in the paper, that the prediction by itself uh, does not affect the actual selling value of the apartment. So it's not like if Alice said your apartment worth $2 billion, it, it affects the, the actual cost. So these users are interested in the predictions only. After an apartment is sold, the, the user that, um, that holds that apartment now has the actual value of the apartment, the actual selling value, as well as the prediction. And so he or she can see the discrepancy between these two terms and decide, decide whether Alice was accurate or not. And, and that makes the user either satisfied with the prediction or unsatisfied with that. And again, I'm going to assume that satisfied user, users uh, translate to revenue for Alice either by increasing the traffic to our website, logging on to our website more often, by uh, offering or taking future services from Alice, or by recommending Alice's services to, to friends and family. So here's an illustration. You have this cloud of points. The, uh, the horizontal axis is the apartment size, just one number that quantifies or characterizes the apartment, whereas the, the uh, vertical uh, axis is the selling value of the apartment. So each point in this cloud is an apartment and a user associated with that apartment. After taking Stats 101 course, Alice can come up with a simple linear uh, regression, the simple line which predicts for every possible apartment size the selling value or, or the, the selling value of that apartment. And this way of pro uh, producing predictions might satisfy some of the users here in green. Or some of the user, users could, could remain unsatisfied. Those are the black points. And being satisfied or not, again, it's, it's not only a function of the discrepancy, the distance between the actual selling value and the prediction, it's also a function of the user himself or herself. I can see, I can think about $1 million as something uh, small, whereas you can see it as, as a large discrepancy. Great. So if Alice wants to maximize the number of satisfied users, one thing she, she could do is just tweak with the objective function and maybe use some deep learning or whatever. But I'm claiming that Alice has some bigger uh, obstacles to tackle, which are, for instance, competition. Okay? So here is a, one competitor of Alice called Bob. He does things completely differently, right? His uh, regression line is completely different. And now we can ask the same questions. Which users uh, prefer Bob and which prefer Alice? And, and, and let's see how it goes in, the, in this illustration. So this user right here would say that Bob is the best because the prediction Bob offers is, is much better than Alice's, okay? 
there are going to be other users that would say that Alice is, is the greatest, granting one monetary unit to, uh, to Alice because she's the one satisfying them. Some users will remain unsatisfied with both of the, these predictions, and some of them will be satisfied with both of the predictions, granting half a dollar, half a monetary unit for each one of the players. And here you see, trust me, I've, I've, uh, I think I did the math correctly, Alice gets $6.5, namely 6.5, uh, satis I see you count now, yeah. <laughs> Alice gets 6.5 satisfied users, yeah, that's the, the green point and half for each blue point, and Bob gets 10.5. Now, it, it's apparent that Bob's strategy is, is, uh, is preferable in terms of the competition, but if you've taken any statistics course, then you would say that what Bob is doing is completely ridiculous because he's completely overlooking the trend of the data. He's, uh, you, you can see that as the apartment size increases, so does the selling value, and again, Bob completely overlooks that. And the main question here, uh, as we tackle in the paper, is whether this behavior, whether there, there is a, an equilibrium for, for this setting. Whether we can think of two predictive functions, one for Alice, one for Bob, such that they are in best response to one another. But things will, will become much more complicated in a second. Here is the informal model. And uh, I'll tell you why. They'll become more complicated. I'm using minimal notations here, so don't worry about, about understanding these difficulties. I'm, I'm going to, to describe the model as, it, uh, as extending the PAC framework. PAC, PAC approximately, uh, probably approximately correct. This is a, uh, um, a well-studied uh, framework in learning theory. We're going to assume there's a distribution over instances, labels, and thresholds. I want you to think about instances as, say, vectors that characterizes apartments, describing apartments. Labels as the actual selling value of the apartments. And the thresholds are, uh, we'll get to that. We're going to have n players. So uh, before that, I have just Alice and Bob, but this was just for the sake of illustration. We're going to have n players. Each one of them will play a predictive function. Namely, each one of the players has this strategy space that could be, for instance, the set of linear functions, but it could also be all the deep learning networks uh, with uh, or all architectures with 100 layers and, for instance, 500 neurons in each layer. So you can think about it in its full generality. We basically use the pseudo dimension of that uh, uh, real valued class of function to go with the math, but I won't get into it here. Each point x, y, and t, an instance, label, and a threshold associated with the user is said to be satisfied with the prediction y hat, and obviously y hat is going to be a function of, of that x, of, of the apartment characteristics, if the distance between y and y hat is less or equal to t, namely if the discrepancy is less or equal to t, okay? As it was before, if several players are, are offering satisfying predictions, then the user associated with that uh, triplet would just select one of them uniformly at random. Great, that determines the payoff of the players. So each player's payoff is the expected number of users that uh, she satisfies. Perfect, just to, to note the, the last thing, the underlying distribution over these instances, labels, and thresholds is unknown. Yet, the players are assumed to have access to a sample of uh, taking IID from this uh, distribution with, we, with which they should optimize their payoffs. And the question is, how can we find an approximate pure Nash equilibrium on the unknown, unseen underlying distribution? This is the main question uh, that, that we discuss in the paper. Great, so for those of you who are not familiar with PAC learning, here is a simple idea. You want to find, for instance, a classifier for saying whether there's a cat in the picture or not, what you do, you get a huge sample, then you run an algorithm on the sample. Maybe that algorithm can also assume that the actual distribution that we care about is the sample itself. This idea, this notion is called empirical risk minimization. You treat the sample as if it was the important thing. And then if some properties hold, for instance, uh, one, one possible such property is uniform convergence, then we are guaranteed that what, what's optimal on the sample would be suboptimal or almost optimal on the distribution with high probability. 
This is, in other words, uh, called generalization. Okay? So this is uh, what, what, what have been studied before. What we want to have is an extension of this ERM notion to multi-agents or to multiple players. And I think that one natural uh, such notion is empirical Nash equilibrium or, here is a spoiler, empirical pure Nash equilibrium. Okay? So what would be an empirical pure Nash equilibrium? It would be a set of predictive functions, maybe lines, maybe deep learning networks, such that a player cannot deviate to another, pro to another strategy and improve her payoff. Okay? Great. So we want to go through this pipeline, and now this is what we did in the paper, and I'll show you that uh, pretty br briefly. Uh, the, uh, the first uh, thing is to show that regardless of the number of players you have, the strategies uh, that they employ, any underlying distributions, or even every sample that you could get, there always exists at least pure, uh, pure, uh, sorry, at least one pure Nash equilibrium on that in that empirical game. Okay, so an empirical pure Nash equilibrium always exists. We show that by potential arguments, and these arguments are later ever uh, leveraged in order to show something about the rate of convergence of, of these uh, dynamics. So uh, we show that after at most m times n log n, where m is the size of the data and n is the number of players, after that many iterations of any better response dynamics, we could find an empirical pure Nash equilibrium. The last piece of the puzzle is to show that uniform convergence hold in our case. And uh, th this, is, uh, uh, th this is the result in, in, with this respect. We show that if the sample is, is large enough, namely it's, it, sh it should be polynomial in one over epsilon, the approximation factor, and the number of players. Uh, delta is the probability that, that uh, a bad event will happen. And this weird sum is the sum of pseudo dimensions. For, I'm not going to discuss that. We show that if the sample is of that size, at least, then any player's payoff under any strategy profile is not too distant from the empirical counterpart. And I won't delve into the details for, for this result, but let me just say, for those of you who are familiar with the, this uniform convergence theorem, I'll say that uh, this result is not uh, implied by any other known result, to the best of my knowledge. And the reason is that people are usually discussing when, when, uh, when you have pseudo dimensions, people are usually discussing a smooth loss. Whereas in our case, the loss is, is like a step. Either a player satisfies a point or it doesn't, right? And I can elaborate on that offline for those of you who uh, were interested. So taking the, uh, these puzzles, these pieces of the puzzle, we can come up with this meta algorithm, which simply goes as follows. Get a large size, uh, get a, a large enough uh, data or a large enough sample, execute any better response dynamics and obtain a strategy profile H and just return it, okay? And um, the, the main theorem is that this algorithm is not only efficient, it also uh, returns an epsilon pure Nash equilibrium with probability of at least one minus delta. And again, uh, epsilon and delta are, are some constants that uh, are greater than zero. Great. Uh, you may ask, why am I calling this algorithm a meta-algorithm? The reason, the reason is that this better response dynamics, this process, assumes that each player has access or can compute a better response or a best response to what the other, other players uh, do under the same strategy profile, which is an interest, interesting question by itself. Uh, in the paper, we, we, showed, we show how to design a linear uh, best response oracle, namely, and an algorithm that shows or that computes for a specific player a, a best response among the set of linear uh, strategies against any other thing that the other players do. Great, we also have some, some um, in order to, to complement our theoretical analysis, we also run some experiments. So uh, here we have uh, so several two player games. You see different sizes of or different structures for the data. We have linear, V-shape, X-shape, and so on. And uh, the lines that you see are the mean square errors. Namely, if you, if you will use uh, this stats 101 tools that you've got in, in, in that course, you will get that. And um, my goal in showing, showing this, the results, is that not only the players can capture the structure of the data, you can see it pretty clearly, not only they can do that, 
but they also segment the market in a stable, in a stable uh, manner in the sense that each line that you see here, or maybe I should, should briefly say what's, what's going on. So the green, the green uh, points are points that get uh, accurate predictions, predictions from both of the players. The red, one, uh, the red ones belong to player number one and the blue ones uh, belong to player number two, okay? So here you can see that we have two lines in each one of these, uh, in each one of these um, uh, figures. The players capture the structure of the data and they are also best responding to one another. You can also see, so the, the rows are decreasing, uh, decreasing level of tolerance. You can see that when the tolerance is high, namely users are tolerant to a high discrepancy, you can see that there is a large segment of the market which, which gets an accurate prediction or accurate predictions from both of the, the players. And as the tolerance decreases, it, the, the uh, green part suddenly disappears. Great, so there is plenty of related work relating to this topic and um, I won't go uh, into it. I'll just say that uh, for those of you who are interested in this, uh, in this line of work on strategic ML, as you've seen in, in this ses session so far, uh, there is a workshop coming on, on on this Friday called Learning in the Presence of Strategic Behavior, organized by uh, Nika Haktalab, Ishai Mansur, Tim Rafgard, and, and myself. And for those of you who are interested in it, you're welcome to, to come and, uh, and join us. Uh, future work, well, there are plenty of, of directions, namely different ways of, of, uh, of of attracting users by, by offering them predictions. Maybe we can also, can also uh, analyze different monitoring schemes. Maybe the players are not aware to what the other players do and so on. That would be all, thank you.